Hello Internet. What's up? <clears throat> Today we are proceeding with our with our testing of the LCW decompression that we implemented for PDF data streams. And the approach that we are taking here is in order to get some reference data, we use another implementation of LCW. Um, in particular, we use an LCW encoder as it is implemented in the TIFF library. The TIFF library comes with some tools and one of these tools is the tool raw to TIFF that converts raw data that you give to the tool, um, converts that into TIFF image data. And you can choose to have this data LCW compressed. And we do this in order to generate some um, tests for our LCW decoding stream. Um, I'm currently extending the test to produce tests with larger data sizes because especially I want to see data that is large enough to actually exhaust the lookup table of the LCW algorithm. So the lookup table can grow to a size of 4K <coughs> entries. And therefore, I expect that random data that is on the order of more than 4K bytes will typically exhaust the lookup table. I mean, it depends a bit on the behavior of the encoder and the choices that the encoder makes and when it wants to clear the table and so on. But that's what I expect. The second thing I want to do is currently we are using pseudo random data and compressing that using LCW. That is actually not a typical use case uh, because pseudo-random data will compress very poorly. And so I want to tweak the data in a way so that, it, uh, that we get better, better compression ratios in order to get more realistic uh, test cases for our LCW decompression algorithm. But first the data size. So um, first I randomly determine the order of magnitude of the data and <clears throat> as a power of two and then i want to modify this i will quickly extend our random number utilities and currently they can only give a full random uint 32 or uint 64 so let's let's extend this to what will be very useful will be a um, sorry a signed uh, random number between some minimum and maximum. That will just be something that we <coughs> can can use all the time in our randomized unit testing. So first we will uh, calculate a <coughs> delta value between max and min. We do this calculation um, unsigned, so we have the well-defined modulo 2 to the 32 uh, with a wraparound. Then we generate a random 32-bit <coughs> value and mod it with delta. So this should be fine because we are using a very good random number gener generator. We are using a mercent twister in our case. So using, using modulo 
should not cause us to get so should not yield your low quality random bits if you're using a simple linear congruential generator you should not do this um, kind of um, modular calculation in order to get small random numbers because they will have a low quality but i think it's not an issue in our cases we are using them as sand twister so actually i think it should be fine if we add here the minimum already we uh, with unsigned modular semantics and then we simply cast back to cast back to signed and that should be fine I think The trick being here that due to the um, due to the twos complement representation of signed numbers, actually if you if you treat your signed numbers as unsigned, they still um, they still form a sequence in in the usual order of the integers. What I mean is that if you have let's say minus two minus one zero one two. <clears throat> and if you if you represent them as two as two's complement, um, let's do it for eight bits so it's easier than you have 254, 255, 0, 1, 2. So uh, in regarded modu modulo uh, two to the eighth power, this is still a normal arithmetic progression and so something like this should should work fine and if should give the correct result if you translate back to uh, signed because actually i mean the plus the cpu implements the plus only once so it doesn't have an addition for signed and for unsigned that that does not exist this distinction only for multiplications where the story gets more complicated. Okay. Um, that's what we needed. So we will <clears throat> create our power of two. And we will modify that and how far, how much will we vary that? So <clears throat> for the small values for the small values it doesn't so for for the first one it doesn't make a lot of sense so if <clears throat> if order of magnitude is smaller than two then we will have zero variation Otherwise, <clears throat> let's say we will have one to the something like that. 
So let's see if our order of magnitude is two, so we would normally get a four, two, then this is um, two to the power of one is two, so we would get plus minus two. Yeah, that seems reasonable. Okay. We should never get an overflow here using this scheme. Yeah, it should be fine. The maximum we should get is um, this one plus half its size. That should be the maximum, right? So let's run it to hopefully generate a larger chunk of data. And currently we only generate a single test case. We will, in a minute, we will um, extend that to generate multiple test cases because we also want to have very small pieces of data and very large pieces of data. Um, and you should, of course, put your semicolons where they belong. And use the correct variable names and then you should be fine. <clears throat> Let's see if I still have some coffee in the coffee maker. No, that's tough. I have to switch to my herbal tea. Uh, so, Let's generate some test data. Yeah, okay, this is still quite small test data. So what we need to do definitely is we need to create multiple test cases. Uh, let's generate a hundred. Simply, we will repeat all of that stuff. And that's actually old stuff. So we will also need um, to put these test cases into some kind of array that we need to print out. So we will define ourselves a struct. Uh, that has some <clears throat> It has an input pointer to an input array and a pointer to a, an array keeping expected data. And so We define an array of these cases at the end. We must close this again.
Actually, it's um, no, I <laughs> I don't want X mode. How did I get into X mode? People, I'm still I'm still yeah. That's uh, I remembered how to get out of X mode. I have no idea what X mode would ever be used for. I'm still fighting a bit with my new keyboard. <laughs> as you notice. So, um, we close the initializer here. We must change this. So, here we only will put an array initializer. Actually, we will, we need a struct initializer and within that we need an array initializer. So let's close the first array here. Let's open the expected array. And let's close here. Let's close the First the expected array, then the struct, and then we need a separator depending on whether uh, this is the last case or not. If it's the last one, we will put no, we will put nothing, otherwise we will put a comma. So... Let's see if that produces something same. Okay, we have we have a problem here that we will, but let's first look if the cases okay we got some debug output still then Uh, that looks fine. That doesn't look fine because it starts with a comma for some reason. Uh, that looks fine. Okay, but then we run into some problem. So first question is, uh, why do we have this comma here and why? Oh, here we are actually missing a new line. Actually, we can do without the new line. So here, let's just do that without, yeah, like this. That should be fine. Oh, here, I just put the comma in the wrong place. Okay. That should be fine. Let's let's comment out some of the debug prints that we probably don't need anymore. <clears throat> so what we're doing here is from this C program that I'm currently working on we write a raw data file, uh, then we call the raw to TIFF utility from this C program. So that's done with the 
with the system command here, so a system query, or a system uh, libc function, and then we actually open the TIFF image and extract from it the compressed data that we are interested in. And we actually need to do a little bit of post-processing on the data because we need to do a bit reversal. Um, we will later verify that this bit reversal is not needed for actual PDF LCW compressed data. Okay, so let's see what the problem is, why the program doesn't. Live long enough to output the second case. So let's run it in remedy. Executable we want to run is generate a CW test data. Okay, is that, oh, maybe delta is zero and, oh yeah, delta is zero, so we, so we get a, an exception, integer divide by zero, okay. That's quickly fixed. So actually, if delta is zero, it's very easy, we just return the minimum. Because it means that minimum and maximum are equal, so um, yeah. I should maybe assert here also just for being clean and sane that that minimum and maximum are in the correct order. But let's see what we get now. We should get quite a lot of data. Yeah, that looks nice. Lots of data. So another small cosmetic thing is that I actually want to nicely format the long data by breaking lines. So we do have a separator already. Okay, and we distinguish the first case and we will also distinguish First one has no separator. Um, otherwise, we will check if index module 16 is zero. Or if it's if, if it's non-zero, we we just print a comma. Otherwise, we print a New line two, three, four, six, 
seven and the eighth one is actually in the format string. Oh, we should of course do the same for the expected data. Let's first see if this works. Yeah, that looks good. So we will do the same stuff here. And this should give us some nicely formatted output. Yeah. So let's pipe this to how do we call it? Is it not? Okay, that, that didn't work. I mean, maybe, maybe the Windows prompt is not smart enough to do top completion here. So let's check how the file actually is called generated LCW test data dot H. You still have the problem that there is an additional line printed that we don't want into in the generated code. <clears throat> wow, this takes a long time. How many lines do we have? 170,000 lines. <laughs> Vim is pathetically slow here, so let's Let's turn off the syntax highlighting. Yeah, that's the extra line that we don't want. We need to get rid of that. Otherwise, okay, here we shouldn't print the, the new line. Otherwise, this looks like valid C code, right? So let's use this actually in our unit test. We will iterate over all our test cases here. We will use a nice feature of our own test framework that we can actually add some information to the error messages about in which loop iteration we are. It's quite helpful sometimes. And Input. Okay, we cannot really use size of input now, so uh, we will need to store the we will need to store. Uh, 
you will need to store sizes. Actually, I'm not even sure if, if our generated code will be valid. Uh, if the, initial, the initialization of the pointers actually will work. I'm not sure about that. We might have to do that differently. But we need to add to this case array the size information. So actually here, we will print the strip size. And here we will print the uh, expected size which is data length uh, we will now see if we get a problem compiling Yeah, that's exactly the problem. We cannot we cannot initialize the pointers in this way with with these initializer lists. Um, we we need to do this differently. We need to first. I think we need to make two passes for the generation. Yeah. We need to make a second pass down here where we actually um, generate this cases array and here we will we, here we can now use the size of operator so Actually, we only need one. Here we simply need to, to define a separate array for each one. SW input new array equals this one.
and there's a W expected array equals Let's see. Okay, now um, I should not have pressed the button for make. That will not work. But we should be able to just generate this one. Mm, is it already generating the new stuff? It's so slow. Yeah, but I mean, it's it's calling 100 times. It's calling this external conversion utility. That's probably the slowest part. So let's see how this looks now. We have input data, expected data, input data, expected data. So apart from the formatting, apart from the formatting, this looks fine. Uh, we have now here the size is cases dot input size and the size here is okay we now need to uh, allocate this dynamically So the size is cases i dot expected size. Um, let's actually pull this out into a variable because we will need this a few times, I guess. Expected size. Here we have cases i dot expected is the expected data, and then we need to we need free data again. Why is it so far up there? So. Let's see. It's compiling. Oh, it's taking forever to compile now. Why is this taking so long? It's 
it's crazy. <clears throat> okay. What is actually taking so long here? It's really the compilation of our unit test that is taking so long, it seems. Is, is this compiler such a heap of crap that it cannot deal with 170,000 lines of simple code? What is going on here? Is it finally done? Yeah. That's totally crazy. Interesting, we have a... St oh, we have a stack overflow because because currently we are putting those arrays on the stack. Oh, and that's probably also, I mean, still no excuse that the compiler took so long, but if you look at the generated code, um, it will have generated tons of instructions for actually pushing the data onto the stack. So let's, let's for just for, for fun, let's look at let's look at the generated code. It should be test test data stream directory. Will be a huge file. Yeah, over five million lines, and where is most of it? What is what is that kind of crap? This I don't understand. It. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Here we have all the the move instructions that fill the stack with this huge array. That's of course nonsense. What we actually wanted to have is static data. So we need to update our generator. Of course, we want static data. So this will be static. And this will, sorry, this will be static. And of course, also the cases array will be static. I hope that now with the static data, the compiler will not be that slow. I still think it's it's insane how slow it got because, I mean, pushing a million values onto the stack is still not a lot of, not a lot of code to generate for a compiler on a modern machine, even if it's stupid. Oh yeah, uh, we need to get rid of that.
actually we don't need to get rid of it we just need to print it to standard error instead of standard input which it anyway should go to standard error probably so oh interesting interesting we run into a bug that will be interesting to see if that is actually if that is a bug in our unit test which is probably more likely or whether we found a bug in the ICW code so let's run test data stream Breakpoints, we don't need no breakpoints. Okay, but where is it? We don't have a source location for this. Well, let's try again. Hmm, <laughs> we don't have a source location. Let's see what our data says, cases are. Oh, we are in the wrong, no. I mean, we should have cases here. We are in the debug build, so why? Okay, here it says we are in the test fixture. Bitch. Uh, yeah, we are in the test fixture. We are in a member function of the test fixture. Right. I don't understand why we don't have cases here. We do have I. Do we have input? We do. Do we have expected size? Probably not yet. This is probably not yet reliable because it's only assigned here. I don't get, why don't we have cases? That's maybe a debugger bug. Because my suspicion is that that this input size is incorrect. Let's send this to the memory view and let's see if the memory has the expected contents. It starts with 80, which is a good sign because the LCW data should always start with 80. 80, 20, 4D, yeah, that looks correct. So this pointer is fine, I think. I mean, we maybe we have a problem because size of actually gives a size t 
that must be con but it should be cast here implicitly right should be implicitly cast to you in two i mean maybe we should add either we should add a explicit cast or we should not use size of here at all uh, let's see let's see if it actually looks sane in the code file the generated code wow everything is so slow as soon as your files get somewhat somewhat large everything everything is so slow it's really ridiculous i mean we are not talking about large amounts of data here wow did i kill vim <clears throat> that's really ridiculous it's alive <laughs> so cases is this the cases array yeah I hate these mangled names. But the strange thing is do we do we output this in the wrong in the wrong order? So the second one should be one, two, three, four, five, five bytes. And that's the, the input is five and the expected is two. That's what we see here. So that's the expected size. Where is, is this, oh, probably it's, yeah it's here okay so that's fine that's the first size yeah that it's fine it's just that this is at the end of this almost at the end of this very long line so i didn't see it so that looks sane actually that looks sane We see that we don't have data compression here. We actually have data expansion, uh, which is to be expected because we try to, to compress pseudo-random data. So this is something we will fix later. But still, so let's, let's as we cannot look at the cases array, um, why, 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 why are things going on? Uh, let's actually make a variable here. Input size. And let's copy the input size out here. And let's put this here so we can actually look at the expected size too.
And if this is a debugger bug, I need to file everything so I can later report this to the remedy author as a, as a bug. Let's see if we still have the same crash. Yeah. Still have the same crash. Oh, we had remedy. If we had remedy open, how could we actually compile or link? Uh, normally you cannot link if you have the executable open. So let's try again. Let's see if we have the correct executable. Yeah, we do. Okay, we got this problem in in the Visual C++ runtime. And if we go out here, yeah, we still don't have cases. Do we have <coughs> input size? Yes, we do. And it looks looks reasonable enough. So this test data stream in it buff does something bad. Oh, ah, this has, this still has a fixed size buffer. Okay, we need to change that. We need to change that. No wonder this is crashing. Yeah, that's a good opportunity to actually, I mean, this has been on my to-do list for quite some time to actually improve our test data stream. Uh, what this test data stream actually should do. So the idea is that you hand an array to this test data stream and this test data stream will feed the array in um, randomized chunks to your uh, code under test. And currently it doesn't do so. So currently it just does something very stupid. It feeds the code, I think, in, in pieces of 16 bytes, which is of course not good not a good stimulus for testing. So what we actually want to do here is we want to do multiple things because the, re the purpose of this test data stream is really to to stress to stress the code that is consuming um, to stress the code that is consuming the data from it. So one thing is we will remember we will remember the pointer to the test data. We will remember its size. We will also, in order that we can make 
do consistency checks, we will remember the uh, the buffer that we allocated. So we can check that the user code does not illegally manipulate the buffer pointer. Also, we will remember the end pointer. Uh, we will also remember the size that we allocated for the test buffer. Because what we really want to do is we want to move this, this buffer around every time we fetch from the test data stream in order to, uh, to shake out bugs in the user code um, due to the user code making uh, wrong assumptions about the buffer staying in the, in the same place. Because the contract that we have for our data stream consumers is that they, whenever they call the fetch function on the data stream, they must consider all pointers to the stream buffer invalidated. They must not use pointers across this call. And so what we will do here is that we will actually take care to move around this buffer in order to make sure that user code is not relying on this buffer staying in the same place. <clears throat> Just thinking how we best should do this. I mean, we could keep multiple buffers, always poison, fill the others with poison, poison data, and, um, and and cycle somehow between them. That would be a possibility. It will also make our tests quite slow if we all the time have to write poison data. We could just dynamically reallocate the buffer all the time, but the problem is that that is not, that is not fully deterministic. Uh, let's do the following. We will allocate we will allocate ourselves a kind of arena or a kind of um, let's just call it a, a test buffer space. We will allocate that and within that we will randomly uh, pick ranges of addresses to be used as the, as the buffer that we hand back to the user code. So let's open this in a preview window so we remember what we actually have here. So first we will remember the test data that is given to us. Uh, we will write here as a uh, contract for the for our caller. We will 
write here that um, that the pointed to data must remain valid throughout the life of this test data stream. So we do not need to, to copy this data because most of our tests actually we use a pointer to a constant array or something. So no need to copy this stuff around. So let's get rid of this. Um, we will need the memory manager. That will cause hmm. should we really use the memory manager? The problem is, I mean, first it causes a lot of changes in our unit tests. The second is the question, I mean, the memory manager is actually for things that are, normally it's only for things that the user code allocates because we use the memory manager to debug the user code and check if it has any memory leaks and so on. So things that are allocated by the test system itself don't necessarily need to go through the memory manager. So I think we can just use a plain malloc here. Okay, so let's proceed. What we need is, we need this to allocate this test buff space. First, we need to know how large we want to make it. Um, I think we want to make it, I mean, probably as, as large as the test data that we get so that we can, in principle, provide all the data in one chunk if we want to. I have a huge file open, so Vim is very slow in the word completion. So let's fix that. Uh, it's which one? Mm, buffer nine is the huge one. Buffer nine and buffer, buffer 17. So, yeah, now it should be fast again. As, as this is test, test code, we do not do proper error handling. We just assert that we got the memory. I mean, progress. So, I mean, we should also check it in the in the debug build, right? So, probably it's, it would be better than the, to do something like this that also that also aborts in the debug uh, in the in the release in the release build. 
So we do have this space allocated. We probably, yeah, we would like to poison the memory, uh, but for this we need, we would need the memory manager to do this conveniently. Yeah, we can. We can just use plain random data from our test random fill bytes. Uh, Sooner or later, I mean, this currently uses the nascent twist. The sooner, sooner or later, we probably, for purposes like this, we want to um, make a fast version of this that uses something fast like XOR shift generator instead of the nascent twist, so which is quite slow. Let's note this down in the also in the test util stuff. So we have filled stuff. Um, now the question is, do we already initialize a buffer or not? Maybe we should, we should randomly decide because streams are allowed to do both things. They can, they can have no, they can have a null pointer buffer at the beginning or they can already provide some data. So uh, let's let's decide that randomly. Let's make ourselves a little helper because we often have binary random decisions. We will do this, I think, simply by, by calling fetch.
problem is that we we need to we need to report we would need so so fetch can report an error but this init buff function cannot report errors so we need to sync the the error reporting here Now this is actually okay. Um, but first, before we do that, we need this kind of stuff. Don't do this. Yeah, also for the init string, uh, we should Same thing here, must remain, remain valid. So um, now we need to take care about fetch. First, fetch is only allowed to be called if pointer is equal to end. Uh, then we will advance the offset. But also we will check some consistency conditions that pointer is, no, pointer is, f is fine. That uh, buff is still what we set it to, so, so that the user code has not messed with these pointers, which is not allowed to do. Okay, and now we will do the actual fetch. Uh, first, we must need, need to know how many bytes we still have available. So if we are at the end, there's two things we could do. Actually, there's three things we, we could do. 
that are valid things for the for a data stream to do. We can either do nothing at all and leave the pointer and the leave all the pointers the same. But then we must not do the advance offset. So So one valid thing to do is just to return in this case. That's a valid thing to do. Um, another valid option is to set everything to null pointers. That is a valid thing, but in this case we actually need to do the, in this case we need to advance the offset. We should probably also I should also check that offset is not modified by the user code probably. I think I don't want to do that right now, but maybe let's make a node. And the final valid option is to simply simply point somewhere so to change the buffer make it point somewhere else but set set pointer and end to the same to the same pointer This is what we will do here, but here, um, yeah, here we will first advance the offset and then uh, first we need to decide how many bytes to provide this time. And here um, we probably should also think in different orders of magnitude. So it might be interesting to provide only one byte or two, but it also might be interesting to provide a thousand bytes, for example, at once.
So let's do it in a similar way. Similar way. Um, that we did so we get some interesting sizes and then we will do basically the same that we did in the <clears throat> in the test generator Okay, and of course we cannot fetch more than we have available. So actually we, it must never be zero. Zero is illegal. We almost must fetch at least one byte if we have any available. So only if available zero, we can get zero. Um, the maximum Uh, should be this one. I mean, maybe for really large buffers, we may, may also want to test returning the whole buffer in one go. So we will get here warning for sign mismatch. So let's cast things. Okay, and now um, we probably want to invalidate First, we want to invalidate the buffer we currently have in the we fill it with random data if we currently have a buffer. Uh, if we had a buffer so far in validate current buffer data.
so we check that um, we check that user code does not rely on this data hanging around somewhere. So we now know the fetch size. Um, so that means we can we can we can determine a random offset And actually, this is plus one here. So we should never get, should never get zero. Um, fetch buff, uh, fetch size. So we can assert that um, the fetch size never exceeds the buff space size that we have. If it is equal, we get a one here, which is fine. Then we always get a zero offset. Um, set new stream buffer and fill it with data. Important is that all of this must work also for zero fetch size because here it can be fetch size can be forced to be zero. So this all of this should work. Yeah, then we get the same pointer here, which is important. Okay, uh, everything should work. We copy from test data plus offset. And that's it. That should be a much more respectable test data stream than what we had so far. The problem is the advan okay, advance. Mm. The advance should be relatively simple to implement. So we first check that we do not advance to an invalid position beyond the end of the stream. Okay, and then we need to check whether we
whether we go beyond so whether we can satisfy the advance in the current in the buffer that we currently have This is the case if offset is not more than offset is not more than the distance to the end. So does this work if you have null pointers? Yes, because then it only works if this is zero and then this is also okay for a null pointer. So if we cannot satisfy the advance We have again multiple options. We have multiple options that are somewhat similar, somewhat similar to those options here. Multiple valid ways a data stream may handle this situation. And we will randomize I mean, in any case, in any case, uh, we must. Uh, hmm. In any case, we must advance. We must advance the offset in any case, right? Because. So one decision is, is, will we fetch or will we not fetch? That's one decision. This is, this is a decision we can make at the end, I think. So advance our fetch offset since we will have to um, change the to invalidate the stream buffer. That's just that is not the advancement, that is just updating our offset to our current location. Current offset to the current position 
Those are current offset to the current position, since we blah, 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 blah. Yeah. So, as we have now advanced offset, um, so one way that is certainly valid is uh, is to detach the stream <coughs> buffer and simply advance the offset. That's certainly something that is allowed. So we can just advance the offset and detach the buffer as we do here. But we won't return. So that's certainly a valid thing to do in this case. Another valid option, and I'm aware that I'm creating strange probabilities here. Uh, we will maybe later want to review the relative probabilities that, that we have. I just want to first get some entropy into this thing. So another valid option. Uh, is to no, it's probably not a valid option to keep the stream buffer. But it is a valid option to set to change to an empty stream buffer. Uh, we should also, uh, we should also invalidate, we should invalidate the data in our current stream buffer also. Changing to an empty stream buffer should be easy. So we, sh we switch to an empty buffer here. That's valid. And then it's of course also allowed to do a fetch at the end. So Should be no problem, right? Why not? Why not fetch? I mean, unless we find we find a reason to forbid forbid this, but under the current contract, the data stream is free to fetch at this point, I would say, if it wants to. Let's see if something still works. 
if any of our unit tests still pass. Uh, we probably should move this test data stream out of data stream and into the test into a test form probably. Okay. Um, <laughs> Sorry, still fighting modifiers, unbelievable. I think I wanted to note down some things still. Okay, we have signed, unsigned, mismatch. Let's see. And is always at least as large as pointers, so we then can cast to unsigned here. Okay, here we we must, yeah, we really should, this should really be moved to, hmm. We have another problem that currently we don't call a destructor on this test data stream. It's not a huge problem because who cares if our unit tests leak some memory from the, from the test system, not from the user code, from the test system. So that's not a Big problem. Okay, same thing here. It's always, I mean, I'm always a bit undecided on this 64 bit size values because hardly anything i expect hardly anything to be so large that it needs 64 bit sizes but on the other hand i mean for example pdf files could be larger than four gigabyte that is definitely something i want to allow
Okay. For which executable does this happen? Generate Huffman tables. Does not use test util. Yeah. I think we really need to move test data stream, the test data stream to test util. That's the only clean solution to this. To move all of this. Here. <clears throat> this will cause a lot of changes in our unit tests, unfortunately. But that's the only clean, clean way. Otherwise, we will run into dependency hell. I think I want this after random. Yeah, a bit of dependency hell we cannot avoid. Data stream default context description. We need to export this. Yeah, this will need a quite a lot of changes now. But that's, yeah, we have to 
we have to go through through that. Oh, I really hate I really hate na nested namespaces. I should never have actually this does not even exist anymore. It's now called test data stream. Now, um, I wonder as, as we do so many changes to the unit tests now anyway, whether we just should just get over it and um, okay, that is something for which we have a nicer function now. Whether we should just get over it and pass the memory manager to test data stream and also call a destructor on it. On it. So far, not too many changes are required, actually. But it's good that we did this stuff on test data stream that was one of these unexciting things on my to-do list, but I just had to do at one point. I really should search for this, but I'm too lazy. Actually, I have Vimgrep working now, so. Let's Vimgrep. should just copy the line. <laughs> of course I do it when I do the fix the last one. I wonder if any of our unit tests will cause problems now that we inject so much entropy to the test data stream. Okay, patch size is zero. Four, six, three. Test quadrant, they failed with test seed. Uh, Let's see if this is hopefully reproducible. So can we I don't know actually since I'm not using Vim terminal for such a long time yet, 
I don't know exactly how to paste something here. How do you do that? Can we insert a register somehow? Paste register, yeah. Paste register, that's what we want. Yeah, that's what we want. Okay. Is it not test seed? Why? I thought it was Test seed I should work. Should work. Oh, is is it like this? No. No, it's with the equals. Why why is this Should work. Why does it say unknown argument? I think I have to debug that. Yeah, it goes here. Oh, <laughs> there's just an S missing. Stupid, stupid, stupid. There is just an S missing. C 
so. Yeah, we can reproduce. That's nice. We can re reproduce the assertion. So let's run remedy again. We should still have the test seed there. We failed. And this is assertion in test util. line this one fetch size is zero Oh, another stupid mistake. Of course, I need here the power of two that I Good that I have put this assert. That paid off. Always pays. Always pays to make sure that you know what your code is doing. Interesting. Very interesting. We have a failing unit test that did not fail before. Two, I mean, okay, the, the generate tilt data, this was not working before, but test inward inputs. Maybe it's just a mistake I made in the test data stream because the problem is we get a different position reported for the end. I'm expecting end of stream. That should really be position one. So I messed I messed up something. I messed up. Probably I messed up something with the position reporting. That is for I-18. Uh, let's first take a look at the code if I see something that is obviously wrong. I think we don't use advance in this test case, so it must be it must be something in fetch if there's something wrong. So we fetch and we run into the end of the We run it to the end of the buffer. Oh. 
I think I need to debug. There's nothing obvious to me that is wrong. So we got exit code one. So let's go to test data stream. test invalid inputs and this is happening because our very nice unit test framework tells us that it's happening for i equals 18. So let's set this condition here. Input should be just a single set. Or C. Okay, input. That's again strange. Oh, I, I put a question mark. What did I write here? Input. Yeah. What is going on here? This is a. Okay, we are seeing a rendering bug here. It's working, but <laughs> yeah, definitely a bug in the user interface. No, it's fine again, it seems. It's funny because I remember many, many years ago when I wrote actually a graphical user interface library with input, with uh, text boxes like this one. I also had, had bugs like this that some random characters would show after the user input. <laughs> so, okay. Okay, the, it decided to go to null pointers in this case. That's fine. We fetch from the, that should now go to a test data stream fetch. What is unavailable? It should be one, right? Yeah, it's one. Offset should remain at zero, that's fine. Let's see what What's the fetch size that we get? Should also be one. Yeah, that's fine. No poisoning because we don't have a buffer yet. What is our random offset? Zero, yeah, we don't have a, a lot of opportunity to be somewhere else. Maybe we should always give a little bit of play to increase the, the arena that we use so that even for a small stream we can move around. <clears throat> so did this work? What what do we have in source source and yeah that's fine. So it copied the C We use it up. We 
we fetch again. Now available should be zero. Ah, that's wrong. That is wrong. Oh, yeah, that's wrong. Because we do not, we change that before we, we always advance the, the offset, but we do no longer advance the offset every time here. So this has to change to data stream position. Is there any other place where, oh, that's fine. Okay, that was really a bug in our test data stream, not, not in the code on the test. I'm never sure whether I should be actually glad or, or sad when I debug something and it's actually a bug in my test code and not in my in my code on the test. I mean, on the one hand, it's kind of wasted time. On the other hand, it's always nice to find out that your your productive code is actually working fine. Okay, now we have now we have a, an error reported from the generated test actually for what we are working on for the LCW stream. It's for the for i equals four. It's the long one. So this is exp maybe exposing some real problem in our code. The question is how to find out. Ah, the first thing I want to try is we do have this early change thing that um, the thing is about when to switch to the next larger code size in the LCW algorithm. And that's a bit of a nasty story because, I mean, in principle, it's totally clear when you have to switch. And um, if you're interested, I have put up a video on YouTube explaining LCW decompression that also explains exactly at which point you should switch to the larger code size. The problem is that for decades people have, some people have been doing that wrong and some people have been doing it right. And so many people have been doing it wrong that now there are basically two accepted uh, versions of the LCW algorithm in this respect and in the PDF file you actually have a parameter to switch between the two. And maybe we are using the wrong setting. We are, might be using the setting that is not compatible with the TIFF library. Because we are using early change false which is actually the, the mathematically correct way to do it. But it might be that we actually need to use early change true, which is the default for PDF and maybe also for the new TIFF library. Actually, if you if you go to um, go to the source code of libtiff, you can find this point discussed. So in TIFF LCW they discussed this here that it 
So I think in TIFF version 5 they had the correct algorithm and then a, an incorrect algorithm became so popular it seems So that they now change to the off by one algorithm. Yeah. So maybe, maybe this will fix the problem. It did. Very nice. I say very nice because what this means it, uh, is that this test is now actually more sensitive than it used to be. It's now sensitive to this distinction because of the length of the data it actually uses um, higher it uses higher code length let's do this run this several times so we get some randomization from our test data stream and yeah seems to cause no problems um, Great, that means we are now testing LCW with some non-trivial data and it's working, it's working fine. Uh, still the test data is not as good as I would like to have it because it's, it's this pseudo-random data without any useful redundancy I thought about multiple ways to get data with some redundancy. I mean, one thing would be to really use, actually use a real world image that we compress. Um, another would be to use, for example, English text or something. We could, in order to quickly, uh, in order to quickly get something up and running, currently we just do this this random fill. could do something stupid like I mean first I need to refactor something because first I need to Uh, this should actually be long, right? But long is... Yeah, this is not... We don't really support large files here with this word, with this version. So that's what I... Would like to refactor into a reusable function because the function that we will need now is the function to slurp a whole file into memory
Do we actually have an SD? Yeah. Okay, and what we can do now that we have this function, we can actually this is mostly for trying out. I want to to do something more more sane later. Because what I will do now is I will simply read one of the source files. Um, maybe this one. 
just to have some text that has some typical redundancy in it. <clears throat> And we will just <clears throat> uh, randomly throw pieces of this text into our data. So let's use something like the square root of the something like this, like the square root, roughly the square root of the number of bytes. If this works, we should see now that um, the data compression actually compresses the data. Because so far we have seen data expansion happening by the CW algorithm.
Yeah, this is something I need to change. We will just print this to standard error. As we should do anyway. I mean, we print it to the seed log file anyway, so maybe we should even remove that, but it's always good to have redundant logging for your seed because nothing is more annoying than finding a bug and then not knowing the random seed that caused the, the bug to appear. Okay, tests are still passing. So let's see if we actually have data compression going on now. I think the easiest way to look at is to look at this cases array. Yes, we are seeing we are seeing data compression because we see that the input to the decompression has this size and the expected output of the decompression has a much larger size which um, reversely means that the encoder was actually successful in reducing the data by this amount. So, of course, for the small ones, we don't really expect to see much compression. Input 6000 expected Okay, this expand, no, yeah, the expected is larger, that's nice. Let's see how the compression ratio does now. Over three times compression. I think that's reasonable for source code. Uh, we should definitely not really do this like this, that we read the source file. This is That's just a quick hack, but it served the purpose. So we have now quite a lot of ASCII text 
going on here. It's not so easy to see, but it's there and we see it in the compression results. Uh, still need to fix some cosmetics here. I think I want a new line here actually. And then <clears throat> uh, for the contents we have a one, two, three, four. I think one, one, two, three, and the fourth one is here. Should be fine. Same here. Yeah, this looks looks better. Uh, one thing we don't have is zero size data. I think I want some zero size data. First, I need to check why we don't get zero size data because. Oh yeah, here we, the problem is just a zero sized image will probably not work. We could create a test case for zero size data ourselves. It should just consist of two codes, the, the table clearing code and then the end of data code. But at least we test a single byte. So that's actually something that occurs in our test data. So that's nice. I'm, I'm getting relatively comfortable with the LCW code and relatively confident that it's actually correct. At least in the, in the variant that we are testing here. There are many interesting things that we can still do and some of them we will do. Um, one thing we will do is we will actually use the TIFF library tools not only to generate a TIFF file and extract the raw data, the compressed data from it, but we can actually also produce an actual PDF file from the TIFF file then, and then use our PDF parsing to, to parse that. We could maybe relatively quickly 
get these PDF files generated. Because there should be a TIFF to PDF. Yeah, we have a TIFF to PDF. <clears throat> My question is just if this will keep the LCW compression. Uh, that's just something we have to try. I mean, let's, let's try it right now, why not? Just from the command line, because we have a TIFF file here. I thought we had a TIFF file here. Oh, it's probably with a single F. Yeah, we have a TIFF file here. So let's Let's just see what happens. Okay, that didn't work. Um, okay, I, you only specified a TIFF file. Maximum TIFF file size exceeded. Why that? That's absurd because this, I mean, this TIFF file was generated by the same library. It tries to write a stream. Interesting, uncompressed stream. Uh, let's try to specify some compression. First meter. Why does it say maximum TIFF file size exceeded? That looks very much like a bug in this tool because our file is not large. It's unusual because it has a, an image that has only a single row. I mean, maybe, maybe the code cannot deal with the large width. Maybe we have some kind of overflow because this is larger than the sine 16 bit range. <clears throat> Let's just pick an example that has a smaller size. Uh, let's just randomize truly for now. So we get every time we get a different size and let's just do it until we get a small TIFF file.
Yeah, that's a small one. So now let's try again. <laughs> Still maximum, I mean, why <laughs> maximum size? That's, that's bullshit. It has a width of five, this image and the height. It's five pixels. It's literally five pixels. How can you exceed the maximum TIFF file size? That's bullshit. Okay, I need to pick up the phone. I think I will end the stream for today. Has been long enough. So thanks for watching and hope to see you next time. Bye.